You might be remembering the previous message or trying to remember it. Um, this might help you. The healing of the deaf man illustrated the need that the gospel be preached with words in an arresting fashion. You might remember that man. He could not hear at all, and he could barely talk. And what appears to us as very unusual ways, he, Christ gets his attention and builds faith in this man. So, now we're still over in the Decapolis, and we have uh, the people and Christ. And we're going to be dealing with something that's very familiar. Have you ever asked yourself, why are there so many miracles in the Bible? Wouldn't it have sufficed to just have recorded a few of the chief miracles and let those stand the test of time? Think about the book of John, for example. It's the last of the gospel accounts. Out of 34 miraculous accounts that the Bible holds in the gospels, he has only recorded eight miracles. Or maybe you're surprised that there really are only 34 accounts. It's a lot less than you perhaps thought. Of the eight that John references, five of them are unique to him and are found in no other gospel. When we look at the book of Mark, Mark has 19 of the 34, which is the same as Matthew, but they're not all the same 19. Luke has the most. He has 21 miracles recorded. Puts him in the first place, right? If we were to evaluate the miracles in another way, you could say, well, there's 34 of them. How many were only recorded one time? 16 of them, actually. Nearly half were recorded only once in one of those four Gospels. You see, each of those Gospels are important. One doesn't rest upon the other uh, as though uh, it needed it. And yet they do work together in, an, uh, in a beautiful harmony. Um, five of those have two gospel witnesses. Eleven of them have three gospel witnesses. And if you were sitting in this room with me today, I would ask the question um, and perhaps get a response, how many have four gospel witnesses? And of course, the answer is two. And the reason you all know this is because of the feeding of the 5,000 and how I mentioned that it, as well as the resurrection, are the two that have four gospel witnesses. It's recorded in all four gospels. Today's account is familiar to that, perhaps a little bit less than the others. Uh, it's the feeding of the 4,000. And in its ranking, it only has two witnesses, Matthew and Mark. And we're going to be looking at Mark's account. And at first glance, when you read through this miracle, it kind of leaves you with the impression of, so what? Why is this even in here? There's nothing new in this account of this miracle. It's, it's almost as though it's a repeat of the 5,000, but with a few different numbers. Is that really what's going on, though? I'll tell you right now, it isn't. I struggled to find out why, you know, I struggled in the beginning to kind of give, give a, get a rationale for why this account was included. Um, why was it that Christ actually um, did this, this particular miracle. We have to ask that question because there's no miracle that was done for no purpose. They all had a specific reason, a specific purpose. The question is, what is that? Um, in John, we can read that there are many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, the whole world could not contain the books. So there perhaps were far more than the 34 miracles, right? But we're going to look at the, thir the, the, the feeding of the 4,000 today. If you've got your Bible, please turn to Mark chapter 8. Um, we're going to read the first 13 verses. The parallel, which we will not read, is in Matthew 15, verses 32 to 16:4. You can just note that. This is the word of the Lord. In those days when there was again a large crowd and they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples and said to them, I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with me now three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from a great distance. And he was asking them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. 
And he directed the people to sit down on the ground. And taking the seven loaves, he gave thanks and broke them and started giving them to his disciples to serve them. And they served them to the people. They also had a few small fish. And after he had blessed them, he ordered these to be served as well. They all ate and were satisfied. And then they picked up seven large baskets full of what was left over of the broken pieces. And immediately he entered the boat with his disciples and came to the district of Dalmanutha. The Pharisees came out and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. Sighing deeply in his spirit, he said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. Leaving them, he again embarked and went away to the other side. As is my custom, I like to review the text and kind of ex evaluate some of, the, some of the surface details before we look into the theology there so we get a, a real and true understanding of what is being said to us. Um, and in that fashion, because this account is so similar to the feeding of the 5,000, I said, let's do, an ex let's do a comparison, similarities and contrasts with the two to see how close they really are. If we were to look at the similarities between the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000, we see that Jesus' compassion on the people. We see that in both accounts. You heard it just a moment ago as I read. And if you look back to Mark 6.34, you'll see that Jesus also had compassion, when, and which, that, which is what drove him in the feeding of the 5,000. We see the unbelief of the disciples in both accounts. They both speak of their lack of faith. We also see an organized feeding. We see this, Jesus had the people sit down in both cases. We also are given the figures of how many were fed and how much was taken up afterwards. So we know they had organization because they were counting. And after both accounts, this seems kind of incidental, but it's true, they, they get in a boat and leave. Now, contrasts to that, the location. That's a significant one. This is not the same place as the feeding of the 5,000. For one thing, we are in, it, it may appear to be the same, okay? Because we do read that it is in a deserted place and we see the same kind of reference in, in this account today uh, as we do in Mark 6.35. But you'll, you'll find there's some differences. First of all, we have, there's no hint in Mark 8 that Jesus has moved on. Um, and with, with all the references to where Jesus went and how he went, one would expect that. So he's in the basically the same area. We do see in Matthew that he moved over to the coast a little bit, but he's still in Decapolis. He's on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, the Gentile side, right? And, and we know this is also true because they get into the boat and go to the western shore to Dalmanutha. Secondly, this place bears little resemblance to the other in another way. In the feeding of the 5,000, we see a reference to green grass or to much grass, depending on the account you look at, right? And, and I, you might remember I made something of that because uh, the idea of grass and s satisfaction in that particular sermon, you might remember that reference, okay? But here, we don't see that reference. There's no grass. Secondly, the people were with Christ three days in contrast to just a very long day with the feeding of the 5,000. Not a very big contrast, but it is significant. Three days without food and water of any significance. Thirdly, the baskets that were used in this feeding were larger than the ones used to pick up the leftovers. And that might seem like kind of a small factor, but it, they, they are much larger, and it's a different word for basket. In fact, it's the same word that's used when, in the book of Acts, they let Paul down in a basket out of the city wall when he was... Uh, after his conversion in the city of Damascus. It's that same basket, that same size, large baskets. And we also might remember there was a discussion in the feeding of the 5,000 of the cost of the bread. We don't see anything like that here. 
Finally, I'd like to address an apparent discrepancy between Matthew's account, which references them going across to Magadan, in distinction to Mark's reference to Dalmanutha. Now, I'll read those two verses because they, it's significant enough we need to address it, okay? Matthew 15, 39, it says, And sending away the crowds, Jesus got into the boat and came to the region of Magadan, which we could read as Magdala, okay? And then you'd say, oh, that, that, that's a place I'm somewhat familiar with. I've heard of that before. Uh, in fact, we think of Mary Magdalene because she came from that area, right? But in our account today, and immediately he entered the boat with his disciples and came to the district of Dalmanutha. But you see, this, this discrepancy can be easily resolved, and it, and it actually becomes another bolstering of the scriptures to us if you look at things in context. Matthew tells us it's the region of Magadan. Okay? And the word region could be translated as the boundary or the border. But Mark says it is the district of Dalmanutha. These are different words. And this word for district has a much greater range of meaning. It could be translated portion or part or land or territory or even peace. Okay? So what we're kind of saying here is they're referencing the same general area with different terms. You might say that you went to... Uh, McHenry County, or you might say you went to Crystal Lake and you'd be saying the same thing, right? It's the same kind of uh, specificity difference there. Um, incidentally, it, it was kind of interesting to find that they, they may have located the city of Dalmanutha in 2013. But we know it existed anyways, don't we? So now I'd like to transition to that theology. This is the most important part of every message, right? The teaching. And what is this teaching? So I'm calling this section the reason for this account, the reason for the feeding of the 4,000. One thing you might ask, you might have asked uh, to yourself, why is David mentioning this reference to the Pharisees? And it's like a totally different account. And that's true, but both Matthew and Mark include the confrontation of the Pharisees, and they both place this confrontation directly after the feeding of the, the 4,000. Okay? These two events are actually intimately connected. We've seen this before. You might remember the woman with the issue of blood and Jairus' daughter, two distinctly separate and yet intimately connected accounts. And this happens numerous times. There's a couple of other references here I was going to bring in, but I think I'm short on time, so I'm going to move right on, okay? What is the issue at hand that the Pharisees had with Christ? It is the issue of authority. They ask him for a sign. Show us a sign. Prove your identity. What is your authenticity? In fact, the, the word test, which we see in this account, it's the same word that we read when we read about the temptation of Christ, where the devil sought to tempt the Lord. And that's really what's going on here, folks. Instead of more signs, he groans deeply in his spirit, and he asks them why they seek a sign. You know, this is the first time in Mark that we see such a request. But in Matthew, we, you'll find that, you know, the, the parallel account is Matthew 15, and we do see this request made. But if you go back three chapters in Matthew, the same thing happens. This isn't the first time that these Pharisees are asking for a sign. And in the Matthew account, Jesus' response to them was, was, no sign will be given to you but the sign of Jonah. I do find that kind of uh, comical in a lot of ways. The sign of Jonah. Three days in the belly of the whale or fish and three days in the ground for the Messiah. Um, but what I find interesting about Jonah is he was a prophet of God, a Jewish prophet sent to a Gentile nation. See, we have this idea that God is a Jewish God, but it looks like God is a God of all men. He is a creator, the Holy One, and all nations reference him. 
Now, the miracles were the very sign the Pharisees were looking for. This feeding of the 4,000, which happened on the other side of the lake, by the way, they could not have seen that one, right? But they certainly knew about the feeding of the 5,000 and the many other healings and, and things that he had done. He, it was, there was no way to hide the notoriety of Christ and his work any longer. It's, it's over two years into his ministry, folks. Now, you might say, well, it seems kind of redundant to say that this, these miracles are the signs they're looking for. But let me ask you, for whom were these signs given? What is the ground of signs and miracles? That's what I want to get to today, because we see this over and over and over again in the book of Mark. And maybe I haven't been real helpful to give us a theology of signs and miracles. So that's what we're going to look at for a moment. What is the basis of signs and miracles? I'm going to start in the book of Genesis. In fact, in the 14th verse of the first chapter of Genesis, it's in the creation account, folks. Now, it's pretty, pretty interesting here. Verse 14. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Now, having said that, let me go back and take a look at something for you. This uh, account, verse 11 of our account says, the Pharisees came out and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And Genesis 1.14 references signs in the heavens. Isn't that interesting? We sometimes just think they're, they're, they're nice things to look at that we can keep time by, right? It's for more than that, folks. Let them be for signs and seasons and days and years. And if I hadn't referenced uh, Genesis 3.15 enough, I'll reference it again, but I won't read it. Um, the sign of the Messiah to be given one day, right? But another reference that I'd like to bring up to you to give you a basis for signs and miracles is Numbers 14.11. Listen to this. God is complaining to Moses about the people during this wandering. The Lord said to Moses, How long will this people spurn me, and how long will they not believe in me, despite all the signs which I have performed in their midst? Do you see how intimately the signs are related to belief? That is a key to this whole thing. Another key we will see in 2 Kings 20, verse 9. Isaiah said, This shall be the sign for you from the Lord, that the Lord, will, that the Lord will do the thing that he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward ten steps or go back ten steps? And, and the, that may sound kind of peculiar, but what man can do that? Here is the prophet of God saying, Ask of God, and it'll go forward or backward. Whatever you say, and that will be the sign that God will do what he has said. Pretty powerful, actually. Because no man can manipulate the stars themselves, which is really what this is. Remember, the sun is one of those signs. And the sun is going back or forward. By the decision of a man? Not exactly. In John chapter 2, of course... This was, I believe, in the wedding of Cana. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, no, at the, he was at the Passover. During the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he was doing. Another reference to belief because of the signs. And then in John chapter 3, we have the account of Nicodemus, a man of the Pharisees, a ruler of the Jews. This man came by, to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. You see, signs do give the authority. So, in a sense, the Pharisees are right to say, what sign? Because that's the point, right? What they're not right about is disbelieving because the, ex the signs that they saw, they didn't like and didn't want to believe. 
Now I'd like to bring forward uh, the account of three Gentile kings who were given signs and how they responded. And uh, see, see, the book of Mark is a book to Gentile believers, to the Romans, to, to us folks. And so it's, it's, it's very, very personal. And we should look at these things. This first account, of course, is the account of Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 4. I'm only going to read two verses there, the first verse and the eighth verse. Then Moses said, What if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? For they may say, The Lord has not appeared to you. Verse 8. If they will not believe you or heed the witness of the first sign, they may believe the witness of the last sign. And of course, what were those signs? The, the rod thrown down with, that turned into a snake? The sign of his hand in his bosom coming out leprous? and then going back in and coming out again. And then even a further sign, take some water from the Jordan and throw it on the ground if it turns to blood, right? But we all know what happened there. Pharaoh didn't believe. He did harden his heart. And what happened to him? He was destroyed along with his whole army in, this, in the Red Sea. Moving on, another Gentile king, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, also a very proud king who had to be made humble before he believed. Daniel chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, Daniel gives a, or Nebuchadnezzar gives a general um, proclamation. Listen to this proclamation. To all the peoples, nations, and men of every language that live on all the earth, may your peace abound. It has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. Ultimately, I believe this king believed, although it took him seven more years living like a beast. You see the result of that in Daniel 4.37. Finally, very, very close in time, we have Darius the Mede, who had become close to Daniel, so much so that he loved Daniel. And remember the plot with the wise men and how they, were, they threw him into the den of lions? Listen to what Darius says after Daniel is restored out of that uh, pit. Darius the king wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language who were living in all the land, may your peace abound. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and enduring forever, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed, and his dominion will be forever. He also delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth, who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. You see how simple this theology is, folks? It's really not that deep. We don't have to go that far. We know what signs and wonders and miracles were there for. Contrary to the popular uh, charismatic beliefs today that signs continue, and yet when you ask them to perform a sign, they can never do it. Further, they often make predictions and other nonsense, and they say, well, we, it's not the same as it used to be. They, they, they don't have to come true. That's nonsense, folks. The scripture makes it clear. The point is the veracity of God and the authority and the authenticity of the messenger and the message. Finally, let's examine that sign which I briefly looked at, um, the Messiah himself. He is a sign. We see it in Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the, son, the Lord will give you a sign. Of, Behold, a virgin will be with child and will bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. But if you move ahead just two chapters to what I consider the, the key passage on the Messiah, it's in Isaiah 9. We'll read the first three verses and we'll jump over to verse 6 and 7. 
But there will be no more gloom for her who is in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Who said, I am the light of the world? Oh, that's right, Jesus. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence as with the gladness of a harvest, as, with, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. You know, I earlier brought forth a number of those miracles, and I began to give you a little bit of stats and so on about those miracles. One thing that's kind of interesting about the miracles, the majority of them were in Galilee. The great majority were in Galilee. There were a few in Judea, in Jerusalem, and there were a few in Decapolis or in other Gentile territories, but we're talking about a few. The great majority, over two-thirds of them, were in Galilee of the Gentiles even though the Jews were living there at that time. Continuing to Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. Some precious verses, guys. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. See, if the Messiah is, the, is a sign, only the Lord could do this, right? We can't manipulate or make this happen outside of his hand. Look in the book of Acts. Or just listen here, Acts 10, verse 38. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who are oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. You see the references, the signs, and there he references then God's being with him because of those signs. Show us a sign that we may believe you. Really? No wonder he groaned in his spirit, folks. For if the words spoken through angels proved unalterable, we read in Hebrews verses, chapter 2, verse 2 and 2 to 4, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty. How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was, all, it was confirmed to us by those who heard, God also testifying with them by signs, both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. You see these miracles, these signs, they were God's testimony. And these Pharisees rejected it over and over and over again. Therefore, no sign shall be given to you except the sign of, the, of, the, of Jonah. And gladly, we read in the book of Acts that many priests became obedient to the faith. We see that Nicodemus and some others became obedient to the faith. They finally accepted the signs. They finally believed. So what should we glean from these thoughts? Well, I've got three items here for you. Signs and wonders were for one purpose, that we might remember our Creator and that He remembers us. Notice that Jesus felt compassion for these Gentiles in this feeding, just like he did with the Jewish group of 5,000. He never considers the Gentiles as second-class citizens of the kingdom. They're his people. Ephesians 2.19, 1 Peter 2.9. There's some proof texts for you for that. Secondly, the blindness of the Pharisees was a spiritual blindness, which all of us must seek healing from with the great physician. Do you have trouble believing sometimes? 
Aren't we all a little bit like Doubting Thomas at times, in moments of weakness? Don't be blind. Salvation is in believing that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews 11, 6. Ask yourself this question, finally. Am I becoming hard like Pharaoh and blind like the Pharisees? Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Recall what Christ said to Thomas at his critical moment. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. John chapter 20, verses 24 to 29. I hope these things encourage you. I hope they bolster your faith. We've got the more sure record in this Bible. And the signs are there. Signs and miracles that were recorded during the lives of eyewitnesses and carried on for centuries for us to see now, here, recorded permanently. You can trust this word and you can trust our God. Amen? Amen.